Yeah, so thank you, and um, thank you especially so much because it's the last session for today, so that you made it. Um, so when um, I wanted to select the topic, um, I figured out so there's a lot of interest around uh, autonomous driving and um, some of the stuff and technologies behind it. So what I brought today with me as a presentation is um, a project uh, and a program we are doing currently, um, which is called RoboDrive. So RoboDrive is basically uh, a platform which is enabling the development of uh, autonomous driving uh, vehicles. Um, we are currently doing this uh, within DXC for one of the largest German car makers, but yeah, we probably will also do this for uh, multiple others as well. Um, and I will give you, let's say, a little bit of an overview around the technology and how it actually works and some of the challenges actually we're having. So, um, so one of the things we, before we start really going into the technology and how it works and what are the challenges are is, and, and this is I think really an important one is, um, so the automotive industry is really changing at the moment quite a bit. Uh, it is not just about, you know, connecting the cars, that's basically where a lot of things have started off. But then it's really about bringing this to the next level with the autonomous driving. But this is also then, let's say, really enabling a lot of new business models. So I think the, the, the interest in the topic is because it will basically unlock a lot of uh, services-based uh, business models for car makers, but also within outside the car industry, I would say. So therefore, it's uh, shared and electric is a, is a really uh, big one. I just returned two weeks ago from China. Uh, I was in Beijing and um, I met one of the startups there and they were really about uh, electric cars and, um, and the startup guy basically explained how they are using connected cars and charging technology and said it's, they are a startup and they said one of the guys from, from a car maker said like okay when are you going to sell your first product and they said like okay we already th sold 30,000 chargers in China. Uh, it's a startup, two years, and they already have their break even. So I think it's, it's almost like a race between, let's say, also the different continents uh, to really get there first because uh, of really it will un unlock a lot of things and will change a lot of the economy. So that's the reason why there's a lot of interest in this uh, topic, also from uh, car makers. So some of the challenges... Um, so there's a classification, basically, uh, if you want to get to fully automated driving, which is level five uh, uh, driving, what you need to achieve just to understand some of the magnitude of the problem is you need to drive around 22 million kilometers, test kilometers, to get there. So in order to basically, uh, when you collect the data and see, and I will give you some more details around the data, basically, you will see you will get to approximately 120 exabyte of data that you need to analyze and process. So 120 exab uh, exabyte. So, and then think about really, you have collected the data, and what you now want to do with the data is labeling data, uh, figuring out the objects, and someone needs to actually do this. If you would do this manually, just for one, let's say, area, it will take you roughly a million person year uh, to do the labeling manually. So what you can easily see, it's a very, very complex problem that we are trying to solve. And um, one of the things you will see here is basically, it has a lot to do basically uh, with how the data needs to be prepared and provided in order for the data scientist to make something meaningful with that. So the requirement basically from our customers, which are then, let's say, the car makers, the OEMs, uh, is really they want to have the data all raw. So it's, they need, want to have all data, not skip data, nothing else. So it needs to be really available to train the models. Uh, and then one of the issues you will see is um, that the uh, data is coming in too fast. So it is too fast to be moved somewhere else. So the data is captured within the car, actually. Uh, and it's very difficult to move it somewhere else because of the, the, the um, amount of data. So the, the numbers you see here is uh, you're, we are having at the moment approximately 50 terabyte per day per car. So there are 110 cars in the field at the moment, test cars. So what you can see is you are easily coming into the petabyte area uh, and we are capturing around uh, four to six gigabyte per second in data. 
So this is, uh, you can imagine, even if you want to just offload the data and put it in a nice data lake, it's almost impossible. You need to come up with a different solution to do this. And so what, the, what you uh, really want to do afterwards, you have, let's say, collected and, and prepared the data, you want to use it to train the algorithms who are actually doing object uh, recognition. So, um, and then also you want to basically classify objects. So this is a dangerous object because it's coming closer to you, or towards you. So you want to figure out um, uh, different like cyclists and, and different other classes of objects. So classification is a really important thing. But then you also want to understand the situation. So it's a lot of image recognition you're doing actually on the data and it needs to be done in real time. So, uh, and after you have really done this, um, you need to train the models in a way that they can really derive out of a situational analysis, what we call it, a uh, driving strategy, like, okay, you, you need to make a move left or you need to make a move right. So, um, so all of the, um, this field testing will be done decentrally. You have to imagine the cars, they can be in Finland, they can be in Germany, they can be all over the world to just capture all these different scenarios. And now you see where we are getting. It's a really difficult problem just to get to this uh, centralized view in order to um, do the analytics. And, and the main challenge in the past before we introduced this new uh, technology was that the data scientist hasn't been really able uh, to work with um, up-to-date data. So it took quite a long time before you get the data back from the test drives. So that's a bit about the challenge. Um, so why this high amount of data? So um, in the past, you, what, you, what you really had was, was conventional driving. You had a CAN bus, you had you know, some sensors in it, but it, you know, it was kind of like reasonable. So it's like something like 15 megabytes per second to capture. So that's pretty okay. Uh, what you now have, you have a whole range of new sensors to enable the autonomous driving. So you have radar sensors, you have three HD cameras on the top of the car. Uh, you have ultra, uh, se uh, ultrasonic sensors to get the distance. Uh, you have leader sensors who are basically trying to figure out what's going on in the environment. So in all that data stream uh, is basically ending up with this four to six gigabyte. It's really complex amount of data, and, and that's really um, the issue here. So what we came up with um, is basically a solution which is um, doing three layers of computation, I would say. So first of all, uh, we have equipped the cars with, um, you know, almost like a data center. So there is actually a, a small platform, a Hadoop platform, a Spark platform, sitting in the car, actually, and doing all kind of pre-processing, um, data collection, ingestion, uh, and uh, really classification of the data as well. So, and then what we uh, uh, did in addition, we um, have uh, developed so-called a, a mobile cluster, an MDM cluster, which is actually sitting on the road, somewhere on the roadside, being pretty, uh, you know, standalone. Uh, and this, uh, let's say, these clusters are then used from the test drivers to actually offload the data to the, test, uh, to the, to the mobile uh, uh, data centers, which then connects back to a, a big data center, a deep learning cluster, what, where we are actually using it as a central data lake. So the cool thing is uh, we are actually using all three layers um, to do actually computation and uh, learning. So we are not actually just pumping up data up and down all the time. So we are actually um, using to push the training algorithm back to the uh, mobile cluster. Sometimes we are pushing them even in the car. So we, do, we use basically all three layers to avoid pushing too much data up, up and down. So, uh, and, um, and then we have also a remote cluster where we are really allowing the data scientists to work with all of the data with all over the world in real time. So this is really uh, something, uh, yeah, what we, what we have developed, and I will tell a little bit more in detail how that works. Um, so this is basically um, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the things we're doing here. So as I said, it's, it's, uh, it's um, uh, object recognition. Classification is a really important one. Uh, so is it a dangerous object? Is it a non-dangerous object? Uh, to track the object then in a moving picture, uh, then also movement prediction, how fast is the object moving? You need to have an estimation basically on, on if it will get into a different situa a difficult situation. Um, so 
some of the providers we, we have here um, uh, are, are listed, you know, and you, you should probably know most of them, like Spark, and um, we, yeah, and we use a lot of, of work with NVIDIA. So currently, this is all installed on bare metal, and there was a lot of questions why it is bare metal. It's actually at the moment because of performance. So we're currently looking at if we can, I mean, technologically, we can deploy this on a public cloud, like uh, on Microsoft Azure or on AWS. Um, but at the moment, uh, it's, it's really the high performance uh, we need, especially with the NVIDIA CPUs and GPUs to, um, to enable the learning algorithms, is, uh, is on-premise, actually. Um, so, uh, and the way how we do it, I mean, DXC is a company basically around integrating. So we are actually integrating everything. So the hardware, uh, the service management, um, the uh, data collection, the data ingestion, um, I will, um, the training algorithms, and also basically uh, the in-car algorithms. So, um, so one of the cool things we do is uh, what we call shadow driving. So just imagine um, before you actually are allowed to um, put a vehicle on the street um, so that it will self-drive, you actually need to show to the legislator uh, and to the, uh, to the uh, government that it basically is doing the right decisions. So what it's doing is there's actually a person driving the car and the robot drives actually uh, pretending that it is driving. So, so that you can afterwards see if the decisions uh, who has been made by the uh, computer has been the right ones, so you can adjust the models. And actually, this is um, to also capture failure rates, um, non-false uh, positives and false negatives. So, so you use basically a shadow driver in the car to prove that the algorithms are working. So this is uh, some of the stuff we do. And, and yeah, so we're integrating that all into one, um, one platform. Um, so this is some of the real pictures, so to speak, from the test field. So what you see on the left-hand side, this is the in-car uh, uh, ingestion. So it's a data ingestion car logger. Uh, so there's also the deep learning cluster. So we have, um, we have now two locations. So one is in uh, Germany uh, and the other one is in, uh, in the United States, uh, where the second development center is. So, uh, and the mobile clusters, uh, that, so that one we have developed together with uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Um, so these are basically the mobile, um, uh, the mobile data centers. So you usually use cables to um, ingest the data because um, if you do it via Wi-Fi, it's pretty slow. Um, so we use cables as some of the cables you see there in the, in the picture. Yeah, so, um, so this is, let's say, some of the pictures. So. When we come now to the architecture, um, so there's stuff on the, uh, on the left-hand side from, from you, so which is basically in the car. Uh, so one of the things um, we, we're really proud of is the RoboCar uh, data ingestion. So what it's actually doing is it's pre-processing the data. It's not just ingesting the data into the, in, into the data lake. It's also pre-processing it, uh, looking at relevant data, uh, and then also making a decision what can be cold data or hot data. So does it need to be uh, pushed in immediately or does it have uh, lower re relevance? And it actually collects all kind of sensor data um, that, that is later on used. And so then the Robo um, Training Optimizer, this is, uh, let's say, onboard analytics in the car. So this is basically the component which is allowing you to uh, to really uh, applying the algorithms while you're test driving. So you can think of it as, as, as you know, kind of like the brain, uh, where you're actually testing and doing already pre-evaluations of the deployed algorithms. Uh, so we use, um, we use this uh, within the car uh, and basically yeah, have also GPUs in the car actually to do this. Um, also, a RoboDrive actor, so that's what I told about. This is uh, the shadow driver, so to speak. So it acts like a driver. It's actually not a driver, but it, it simulates uh, that the car is self-driving while a real um, driver is driving. Uh, and so it, it collects the data there. So we talked about the uh, geo, uh, distributed data lake. Um, that's the one thing. And then the RoboDrive trainer, that's a cool thing. I mean, this is basically uh, a highly parallelized um, uh, deep learning platform, so we use TensorFlow for this, but it's not just TensorFlow with uh, GPUs, we actually uh, are able to really scale all of the different data centers to use the learning, and this is really some IP we have developed there because it's not so easy if you want to use, let's say, different data centers for the same training algorithms. 
So we can actually distribute the learnings uh, to different uh, data centers and then collect it back and even use the mobile, uh, uh, let's say, the mobile data centers. Uh, and then basically, last but not least, um, we have one platform for the data scientists to develop the algorithms themselves. Uh, so we use Juniper for that. Um, so what, what we also figured out, sometimes it's really difficult uh, to kind of um, get to those mobile data centers somewhere in the end of the world, like just, you know, I, I don't want to say Finland is in the end of the world, but uh, sometimes it's really difficult to get network connectivity, actually. So what we, what we have also uh, done is, a, let's say, a mobile version which is sitting in a car, actually having an own Wi-Fi access point, so there is no cabling required at all. So they drive basically around where you want to do the test drives, and then they are basically there to offload the data and then to put it into the data center. So that's another one what we just currently developed, and that's uh, also a super cool, super cool thing. Um, so when we look, uh, let's say, more at, at the... Um, within the, uh, let's say, how we're actually processing the data. Uh, so there's um, the so-called lock device, which is actually collecting the data. And then when we go into the uh, Hadoop Mesos cluster, you will see there are different zones. Uh, and we use those zones to actually process it in different ways. Um, so first of all, is really just the landing zone. Um, and even within the landing zone, and I think that's uh, that's also was important for the uh, OEMs. It's the end-to-end -end security. So the data is actually secured in the car when they are capturing the data till it's really being used uh, with the data science. It's an end-to-end -end, um, uh, security behind it, which was also pretty complicated because, to be honest, Hadoop was not really really good at uh, managing. Uh, kind of like security and access rights and those kind of it was a bit of a complicated thing to really do this, but uh, we, we managed this. And then after the landing zone, you have the input zone uh, where you're really uh, looking at the data, pre-processing it, cleaning the data, uh, take, you know, taking away unnecessary data, and then really go into the transformation and then into the analytics zone. Once it is in the analytics zone, you can, we start using the training models. And the training models are, uh, you know, kind of really complex because um, so we have deep learning models, but they're also, let's say, classical um, uh, supervised learning models. Uh, so we need to really allow to use all kind of different uh, models on the different behaviors. Um, so in a summary, um, what we wanna, where we want to bring this as a, as a next level is really uh, to kind of um, use really this at a scale to really get to even more complex models. So uh, we, we talk about million node management, which basically means um, think about, um, let's say, really when you're bringing in, uh, you know, even more complex um, connected car scenarios where you actually want to use a, a collection of cars basically to figure out what is happening with the traffic. How can I really optimize traffic? How can I really uh, make decisions on what is happening if an accident happens? So, you know, so we're really thinking about future scenarios where you need to really have more advanced analytic models. And this is uh, not just a question of getting to more compute power. It's also, in, let's say, an architecture and a software engineering question where you really want to have massive scalable uh, learning and training models. And this is something uh, where we are really looking uh, at. Uh, in particular also with hardware makers like uh, Mobileye. So we want to really use also, let's say, edge compute and some of the technologies to push it really back into the car. So the inference algorithm ideally should really happen in the car without the need to speak back to, uh, to a, a centralized um, network. This is something we're working on, so the edge compute part is really uh, an important one. And then uh, this is what we, what we mean with ultra-efficient hardware. So that's, uh, one of the issues uh, is really uh, power consumption. So if you want to have more complex model, the risk is really that the power consumption will go up too, too much. Uh, so you need to think about, you need to always balance what uh, trained models will be go into the car and what will be then offloaded from the car. So this is some of the um, overview, let's say, to yeah, give you a basic idea on, on, on what we are doing. And, um, uh, and also maybe one of the questions which is coming up, uh, up sometimes is, um, so we're just providing, let's say, the platform and the tools. What we are not doing with, with my team is basically, we are not the ones who are kind of like developing the algorithms to do autonomous driving, yeah? So this is the OEM typically who is doing themselves. So we help them 
we uh, kind of help them to really do it in a proper way and to have a scalable data science platform uh, and the tools and processes and platforms and data wrangling. But what we are not doing is uh, we are not developing their algorithms. It's the OEM's algorithms. So this is pretty much it in a, in a, in a nutshell. Um, a bit faster, I think. So maybe one, one of the th last things I want to uh, bring in here is, um, so maybe a key takeaway for, 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 for what we just saw is, um, yeah, we use basically uh, the local model inference. So this is really an important one. So the architecture is really made in a way that we can push uh, training algorithms down to the uh, cars, actually, and to the MDM. So this multi-layered uh, training model is a really important one. And um, so it's really a place where, you know, we are looking for data science to scale this up. So it's... Um, so we have really the need to get more data scientists on board to really get better with that. So if you uh, are interested, it's, it's, uh, I'm also here to talk. Uh, and also the holistic approach is really, uh, we want to have the best data scientists and the best developer experience we can provide to, uh, to our clients and customers so they can really concentrate on the algorithms and they don't need to take care about, okay, where's the data coming from? How can I clean it up and so on and so forth? Because it's not manually doable. Uh, you need to automate this, so automation and really the service man management behind it is something we're taking care of. Yeah? So, and with that said, I stop it here, and maybe we have a couple of minutes for, talk for questions. Cool, great talk. Um, yes, we have a lot of questions, actually. Okay. <laughs> so, let's directly start with... As you said, um, we have a, you have a very high amount of data. How long does it take to train your models? Yeah, I mean it's uh, typically not. Uh, I mean it's it's not one model. Yeah, so you have to think about it's it's like a hierarchical system. And typically, what we are not doing is train all the models on all data. So what you do is you're trying to look at a certain aspect, and you have a model. And that can be something, let's say, which can happen overnight, but it can be also something which maybe takes days. Yeah? So this is, uh, it really depends on the model we are training. Uh, and typically, we are, we are not retraining everything. So it's really componentized uh, a system where we are really training, let's say, model by model, and we look what we want to train. So uh, otherwise, so actually, it's a good question because actually it has a lot to do with um, how you set up basically also the data science process with the OEM. I mean, they have let's say, also groups of people who are concentrating on object recognition, then there are people who are concentrating on, uh, I don't know, decision-making uh, processes for driving strategies, so there are different groups within, uh, within the team. Yeah. So we don't do everything at all, but it can from days till weeks. So as usual, it depends. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what's your differentiating factor, or where do you plug into the existing ecosystems? BMV? Yeah, actually... Actually, uh, I'm not going to comment on, on actual customers, but uh, so, so the OEMs are, are our customers, so the car makers. Uh, so we are helping, I mean, of course they do this, um, and uh, we are kind of like helping them to get better, right? I mean, it's, it's, um, we're not uh, driving, you know, we're not developing an autonomous driving car. It's actually we're kind of helping them to get better um, and to get that capabilities on board. Um, with Tesla and Google, or Google is maybe an Uber. Um, good question, we don't know. So what I'm seeing in the automotive industry, at the moment it looks like no one is really very interesting in just taking that stuff over. I mean, the Chinese car makers, they develop their own stuff. Uh, the European car makers, almost all of them are doing their own um, algorithms. Google is doing their own stuff and Uber is doing their own stuff. So it's not yet in a phase where people are like, okay, let's share this. Okay. okay. Um, and how are the robo drivers performing in regions with poorly developed and maintained road networks? Ro ro maintained road networks? Uh, robo -drivers um, I think the question means that... Road um, uh, probably mean uh, mean like net network connectivity, I guess. I'm not really sure. Yeah, I think so too. So, so if it is like as I said, if it is an area where we have really bad, uh, uh, let's say, connect connectivity due to 
a reason so it's not really good to uh, uh, develop. Then we use those mobile, uh, mobile data centers on the trucks. Yeah. So that's, and then use uh, access points and drive them where they have better connectivity. Ah, poor road quality. Well, I mean, this is, um, to be honest, uh, uh, I'm probably not the best person to answer this because it's, uh, it's probably more with the people who actually develop the algorithms. Um, but uh, yeah, what I would assume is it's, it's also the question of how good, uh, how much, I would say, how much training data do you have to deal with the situation? So if it is a very unique uh, situation, yeah, and you have not a lot of data, then it's probably very difficult to train a model that can deal with, let's say, bad road conditions or something like that. So if you, um, uh, and then you probably need to figure out, okay, maybe if the road signs are really bad, uh, you need to figure out, so the HD camera is actually seeing even more than a human being, yeah? So, and, and the assumption is if a human being can drive, uh, with the data, just with the, with the eyes, uh, then actually the data should be enough. But then you probably need to retrain the model or have a different model in place for those kind of things, I would guess. But it's always a tricky question is, do you have enough relevant data to, to do this? Uh, that's probably like a special case. Okay, let's do one last question. Um, what's the advantage of having GPUs in the car for pre-processing? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's really, uh, we want to avoid, let's say, pushing too much data back, right? So if we can use uh, really, let's say, local training or retraining, so there's uh, like this two-shot models where you basically, you have a trained model, you bring it in, you just have, let's say, some additional small amount of data, and you can do the retraining. And so you don't need to actually push all the data back, do all the loop, so you do it actually in a small increment. And then you can speed it up. I mean, it's, uh, it's the most, uh, at the moment, it's for us the most uh, power efficient way to do it. Um, but yeah, let's see. I mean, uh, Google is coming up with some interesting new stuff. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. we can uh, also advance this one, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. You did an amazing job. Thank you.